George Galloway, and the mother of all talk shows. Welcome to the Open University of the Airwaves with George Galloway. 10,000 Africans landed on the Italian territory of Lampedusa over the last two days, completely swamping the local inhabitants. It used to be the other way around, and not just in the Roman times. And a French army is about to invade Africa. And the government in Niger says that France is gathering forces in neighboring West African territories for a full-scale invasion of the garden. And a storm is brewing in the Kremlin this evening, where the midnight oil is being burned as the Russian government gets ready to respond to a British act of war on the anniversary of the defense of Sebastopol in 1854. That's right, Crimean War 2.0. And three great guests for you tonight. Fasten your seatbelts. It's going to be a bumpy night because it is the mother of all talk shows. Curious about our curriculum? Have something to say? Then call us now to join the debate on the mother of all talk shows. The only education you can get for free. George Galloway. The mother of all talk shows. With George Galloway, the world is our classroom. And you're welcome to sit in and join the seminar. Prime Minister Meloni has thrown her lot in with Joe Biden and the United States of America, even at the cost of relations with other members of the European Union. But that is proving no defense to the thousands upon thousands, 10,000 in the last two days of illegal immigrants from Africa arriving in Lampedusa. Mind you, it's not so long ago when the Italians were invading Africa, but this time they were armed to the teeth and intent on conquest. Yes, that's right. The Italians in Libya, the Italians in Abyssinia, remember that in particular, the Italians were once a great colonizing power and thought nothing of invading African territories and indeed other territories, like Albania, for example. I'm not even going to touch on the period of Roman conquest when Italy conquered most of the world, certainly much of Europe, except Scotland, where they built a wall to keep us out. Hadrian's Wall, it's called, although Hadrian himself never laid a brick of it. I make the point to counterpoint the French invasion of Africa, which is apparently imminent. And that's not the first French invasion of Africa either. Otherwise, half of West Africa would not be Francophone today, would not be using the French franc as their compulsory currency, would not be forced to deposit their sovereign wealth in French banks, and would not be selling for 80 cents a kilogram uranium that actually costs 200 euros per kilogram on the open international market. I mention Niger by allusion because that's where the French are planning to invade. I think they'll have a very hard time, not just against the Niger army, but the Niger people and the Burkina Faso army, and the Burkinabi people, and people in the neighboring parts of Nigeria who are entirely the same people as live across the imperialist-drawn border 
in Little Niger. I look forward to the French getting a bloody good hiding. I'll make no apology for saying so. There is no case for France to invade Niger for the sake of what? 198 euros and 20 cents a kilogram. It's time for France to accept that its days in power, both as a direct colonizer and then as an indirect colonizer, are over. And the African people have every right, indeed every duty, to rise up against the European colonialist army that appears to be gathering. A gunboat has just arrived in neighboring Benin, and there are reports of French armed formations forming up in certain West African countries. Shame on those. Shame on those. But the big story tonight, apart from the 9-11 anniversary, to which I shall turn in a moment, is the storm that is brewing in the Kremlin as the midnight oil is being burned, as the Russian government decides how to respond to the potentially world historic attack last night on the Russian Navy in Sebastopol in Crimea. In 1854, Britain and France attacked that very place and the Russians made a stand there. It's called the Defense of Sebastopol. Look it up. The French and the British chose that moment and that place to attack that which they thought was the heart of the Russian Empire at the time. The Russians have never forgotten it, even if most of you have never heard of it. The European powers invaded Russia time and time and time again. It's the principal reason why Russia will not accept the presence of NATO in the Ukraine on its borders because invaders have traditionally invaded Russia from those territories. If you can't see that, you're probably willfully blind. If you can't understand that, then whilst you may have the defense of being stupid, it's unlikely that that defense will pass muster. The Russians know that Crimea, which is indeed their heart, and which has been the fortress of the Russian Navy since before the United States of America existed, will never be surrendered and therefore can only be attacked, and only when in dry dock, and therefore bereft of anti-missile weapons with which to bring down any attacking force. But the big thing about last night's attack on Sebastopol was that it was a British attack on Crimea again. 1854, 2023, are days that will live in infamy, in the Russian character, in the Russian body politic, and in Russian intentions, which are right now being hammered out in the Kremlin. 10 British storm shadow cruise missiles were launched at the Black Sea Fleet in Sebastopol last night. Seven of them, it's said, were brought down None of us can know exactly what came down and exactly what got through. And it is indeed an embarrassment to Russia that three missiles at least hit their targets, hit a warship and hit a submarine, both of them in dry dock and causing death and destruction and massive photogenic fires, which the Ukrainians have put to good use in their propaganda work today. But this was not a Ukrainian attack. These cruise missiles were given to Ukraine precisely for the purpose of attacking Crimea and other Russian territories. Long-range missiles that have to be carried by an aircraft 
from an airfield which the British were undoubtedly involved in targeting and in maintaining. This British attack on Russia will not go unanswered if I'm any judge, and I may not be. But if I am any judge of the Russian character, and I have been close to Russia for more than 50 years of my life, I think I know them at least as well as Mr. James Cleverly in the British Foreign Office. It's my view that they will regard this as a direct act of war by Britain against Russia. They will not accept that the hands on the joystick of the airplane that launched them may or even may not have been Ukrainian. They will regard these missiles and the precision with which they were delivered as a British affair, as a British job. And tonight, right now, the Kremlin lights are still twinkling as decisions are made about how to respond. I take no pleasure in that, for I do not believe that the British government is acting with the best interests of the British people in mind. Neither were the British people consulted about this act of war. Even the British rubber stamp parliament was not consulted about it. Perhaps there was no need. There's no opposition, none at all, inside the British Parliament. How different from the day that the Labour opposition stopped David Cameron in his tracks when he was about to launch a blizzard of cruise missiles on the Syrian Arab Republic only a few years ago. Now there is no one, not one, not a mover, not a seconder, let alone a teller to muster any opposition to the British government's actions. But I think that Britain is going to pay for this attack on Sebastopol. It may be tomorrow, it may be next week, it may be next year, but I believe that Britain is going to pay a price for its irredentist, insane hostility towards Russia, which has stretched unbroken, except for a brief period when Russia was lying drunk on the floor and having its pocket picked under Boris Yeltsin, unbroken since 1854, and indeed even before that, since the time of Catherine the Great. That peculiar ancient hatred of the British ruling elite for the people of Russia, a ruling elite now joined by juvenile Trotskyite scribblers in the British trade union movement at their Congress in Liverpool this week. This hatred of Russia will not go unreciprocated. And we'll be here as the mother of all talk shows to tell you what seems to have been decided in the Kremlin this evening. That is, if we're all still here. Speaking of storms, a storm has swept away thousands of lives in eastern Libya. I mention it because there was a time, not that long ago, when our concern for the Libyan people was, well, overwhelming, so overwhelming, that we had to invade Libya and destroy its government and blow its bloody doors off and murder its leader because we were so concerned about the poor people in Benghazi who were about to face an invasion from the West, from Tripoli, from the forces under Colonel Gaddafi. Do you remember it? Benghazi, actually, another auspicious anniversary when the American embassy was attacked and several of the American diplomats were murdered in cold blood. And Hillary Clinton didn't even pick up the phone because she'd left the embassy all but naked as the hordes of Libyan Islamist fanatics surrounded it. But all that sympathy, empathy, 
all that concern for the people of Libya would appear to have evaporated overnight. The thousands now being washed up on the beach in Libya go almost completely unremarked in the very same media that was filled wall to wall with the need to invade Libya just a decade or so ago out of our concern, our tender hearts for the fate of the Libyan people. Not a finger has been raised in support, in defense, in assistance for the people of Libya. A very good example because it's time that people realize that which is a huge elephant in the room. Namely, the our concern and the news agenda for one area after area, one people after people, one tyrant after tyrant, one new Hitler after new Hitler is entirely transitory, entirely self-serving, and entirely fleeting. When the moment comes that that people, that country, that cause celebra has been deemed past its sell-by date, the wheeling and turning is done with the precision of the brigade of guards. No one even feels a clunk as they wheel away and onto a new item, a new issue in the news agenda. Why do I mention that? Well, let's take Mr. Juan Guaido. You've probably forgotten him. But the British government, the European Union, the American government, the Bank of England, the courts in Chancery Lane, all decreed that Juan Guaido was the new president of Venezuela and, more importantly, was thereby the heir to the very considerable sovereign wealth of the people of Venezuela, which was all handed over to Mr. Juan Guaido. The fact that Juan Guaido was not even the leader of the opposition in Venezuela, never mind the president, the fact that nobody in Venezuela regarded him as the president of the country, the fact that nobody ever cast a single vote for him as president of Venezuela, he was deemed to be the president of Venezuela and given a billion dollars, two billion dollars worth of Venezuela's gold by the Bank of England, in parenthesis, guaranteeing the only a grade one idiot abroad would ever deposit a penny of their sovereign wealth in London again. This matter was fought out in the courts, and the courts found in favor of Juan Guaido. Where now? is one Guaido. He's a student at a college in Florida, USA, long forgotten in Venezuela, but not forgotten by those of us with a memory longer than that of a gnat. We can remember many other such stooges that were for a fleeting moment the great white hope of empire. There's a man now enjoying undreamt of wealth who was just a year and four months ago the president of Afghanistan, so-called, who left with sacks, sacks full of banknotes of every denomination overnight as a dismal, grisly end to a 20-year war and occupation 
of Afghanistan closed. Closed just like that. All those tens of thousands who lost their lives. All those trillions of dollars that we spent in 20 years was over almost in a heartbeat. Although many a heart stopped beating on that final day. The truth is, we never cared a fig about the people of Afghanistan. We punished them twice. First by supporting the fathers of the Taliban and Al-Qaeda and putting them into power in the first place. And then punished them all over again after 9-11. I'm going to talk about 9-11 tonight. Not the 9-11-1973, though that occupied me very greatly at the time. When Americans supplied jets, with Americans in the Situation Room in the White House, oversaw and coordinated the overthrow of the elected Socialist Prime Minister Salvador Allende. May God rest his sweet soul. That's for another time. Tonight I want to remember the second 9-11. I want to remember the nearly 3,000 innocent Americans who lost their lives in the Twin Towers. I want to remember the hundreds of innocent passengers who boarded airliners only to discover that they were destined for a dreadful demise at the end of their journey. I want to remember the firefighters and the police officers and hundreds of sundry others, many of whom had no duty to do so at all, ran towards the flames ran towards the disaster that they could see with their own eyes, even as the buildings crumbled and fell. These brave men and women plunged to their deaths, trying to rescue others. I want to remember also all of the events that led up to this act of mass murder, terrorist mass murder on 9-11. And I want to call for a new inquiry to answer the unanswered questions which have grown and grown in proportion over uh, these last 20 years. You see, not many people now believe the official narrative. There are more holes in it than a Swiss cheese. And those holes have got to be closed. And any presidential candidate who makes as their proposal in their platform to reopen the issues that have not gone away about 9-11 will certainly reap support at the ballot box from the millions of Americans who no longer believe that official narrative. It has soured faster than the narrative that said there was no conspiracy to kill President John F. Kennedy, whose anniversary we will also mark in November on the mother of all talk shows. Now, when I talk about holes, I'm not one of these who pretends they didn't see the airplanes strike the Twin Towers. I did. And I've since seen it from several different angles. Those who describe these planes as CGI planes inserted by the US government or by television are either fools or knaves insulting the memory of those who died insulting the 
memory of those who were on the planes and lost. I don't know in their theory whether all these people are still alive on a love island somewhere in the Caribbean or in the Pacific. But it's a big insult to say that planes didn't hit those Twin Towers. But who was flying those planes is an increasingly open question. Who were are Al-Qaeda is an increasingly open question. The skill with which these aeroplanes struck these buildings without navigational aid, but their own flying skill alone, is highly suspicious to me. Building 7, which fell down in its own footprint when struck with no planes at all is very suspicious to me. The plane that hit the Pentagon doesn't look like a plane to me. And if a plane, the striking of a target so low by some fledgling Arab local flight school graduate with no graduation certificate, who couldn't land a plane, is very suspicious to me. The conduct of the Bush administration in the days immediately after 9-11 are very suspicious to me. The use to which 9-11 was put to murder millions of people all over the Muslim world is very suspicious to me. Who these hijackers were, who they were really working for, is very suspicious to me and to millions across the world, not the least in the United States of America, not the least in New York City, where most of the killing took place. So I believe it's time, more than time, to start a proper debate and to try and fill in these dreadful, awful holes. It's going to be a bumpy night. Fasten your seatbelts. It's the mother of all talk shows. I defy anyone to contradict the point that I just made that every person alive today was born of woman. So why would we say that the people in the labor wards, in the maternity units, are people who are giving birth? Why can't we say women? Why can't we say mothers? Why can't we say women who are breastfeeding? Mothers who are breastfeeding? Why do we need to say people who are chest feeding. All of these words, and indeed all of the trend that you say you dissociate yourself from, of transgenderism, transmania, I call it, are all taking rights away from women. You are listening to the mother of all talk shows with George Galloway. Now, the last time we asked this question in a poll, uh, about 120 episodes ago, do you believe the official count of 9-11? Only 1,500 people voted. 15,000 people have already voted, and I'm only announcing this poll now. Do you believe the official account of 9-11? Yes or no? You may disbelieve it for any number of reasons, but do you disbelieve it? at all is the question. You can vote on my Telegram channel, t.me forward slash George Galloway, on my Twitter, on my X. You can vote on the YouTube community poll and on the YouTube stream. The phone numbers to call if you want to comment on any of the issues raised tonight, here are the numbers. Free of charge in the UK and Ireland, 0808196 that's 0808196 
and toll free in the United States and Canada. Plus one eight four four nine four four double three double four. That's plus one eight four four nine four four double three double four. And if you're in the rest of the world, which let's face it, easily most of you are, it's four four two zero three nine double six two six two five four four two zero three nine double six two six two five. Now, my first guest is a former television colleague of mine, now mainly pounding away at her computer, producing one of the books of the year. I haven't yet read it, but people I respect have, and the number of grandees who've contributed the blurb to the covers is simply amazing. I had no idea that Anya Parampil had quite such reach, but she deserves it. Anya Parampil joins us now. Anya, it seems like a lifetime ago uh, when we used to talk every night uh, during the every week day. on the uh, television. So much, yeah, so much has happened since then, not the least of which you've written a blockbuster, Corporate Coup. Tell us what it's about. Thanks so much, George. Yeah, people probably mostly associate me with video, but for the last two and a half years, I've worked to compile my reporting on Venezuela, the failed, absurd attempt to install a government, coup government in Caracas before an actual, they, they where they announced, they rolled out the regime change mission accomplished banner before they'd actually changed the government. Uh, beginning in 2019 with this recognition of Juan Guaido as president by the U.S. and its allies, I compiled my reporting, which I, I spent over three months in Venezuela over the course of two years. I developed close relationships with people on all different sides of the political spectrum. Obviously, people have seen my interviews with members of the government, but I also maintained good connections on the opposition side, surprisingly enough. I also built relationships with people working in the U.S. financial sector, the o international oil sector, and U.S. Po political side as well to produce original investigative report, a report that I think isn't just about Venezuela. It's about using the Venezuela case to understand modern U.S hybrid regime change tactics, what they use, what the West uses to target so-called enemy countries that resist the Washington consensus when they can't use traditional military tactics. So that's the diplomatic assaults, unprecedented diplomatic assaults that the U.S. unleashed upon Venezuela, including seizing its embassy, sovereign embassy in Washington, D.C. The covert destabilization tactics the U.S. uses, for example, the failed mercenary invasion of Venezuela that took place in May of 2020, the propaganda and information war, which is key, as, as your viewers will know, understanding and dissecting how the mainstream media participates in, or how, how they participate in the overall program of regime change basically act as foot soldiers for Washington and its allies and putting forward a narrative that reinforces the, the Western line. And ultimately, oh, and the economic sanctions as well, financial terrorism being the number one, I think, tactic the US has leaned on since it became less able to wage conventional warfare. What this book does is explain how that network works, illustrating it through Venezuela. For example, I show how sanctions systematically destroy the economy. And, and this is a playbook that then is again applied to, you can apply it to Iran, to Moscow, to even Kiev, obviously the Maidan coup is the same blueprint. You, using USAID and these human rights organizations to really just further U.S. and Western financial and corporate interests in these foreign countries. So I tell that story, but ultimately where I end 
is that the U.S., the West, this transatlantic nexus has gone too far. And what the book also focuses in, on is how developing powers, Russia, China, Turkey, India, and Venezuela are coming together and forming or have come together to form an alternative to the Western centered financial system. And I believe that a multipolar world is inevitable. It's here. And this book tells some of that story and ultimately makes the case that the U.S. should grow up and learn how to participate in the multipolar world, because I think we in the U.S. would be better off if our government gave up on this imperial project. One of the common denominators of all the cases you cited there, and you might have added Iran, is that they were all, in the end, complete failures. Uh, Iran wasn't brought down. Venezuela was not brought down. Russia isn't being brought down. In fact, its economy is doing rather better than most of ours, if not all of ours. Uh, these uh, tried and tested methods are all complete failures. Uh, at what point does the Washington establishment say, well, look, these things may or may not have been worth trying, but they've all failed. It's time to come up with a new routine. That is the question that I ask myself every day, and that's what drives me to do this work to sit here in Washington, D.C. and try to get the attention of policymakers and say, look, this is backfiring against, even on a practical point, our own interests as the United States. And I can I can give you an example. You're right. All of these, the targeting of Iran and Venezuela and Russia are particularly important because it feeds directly into what we just saw at the BRIC summit in Johannesburg, which I covered Many people in the West may have been surprised that U.S. allies, such as Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates, actually took steps to join BRICS, which is regarded as this alternative to the IMF transatlantic financial network. And really, I wasn't surprised because what I have and what I detail in the book is how over the course of the last 10 years, by targeting Iran and Venezuela particularly first, these are two major oil producers. The U.S. has destroyed Venezuela's oil sector through sanctions, and I detail how in the book, so much over recent years that people might not even realize that for most of the last century, Venezuela was a top, if not the top, oil producer in the world. They have the largest oil reserves in the world. In fact, you might be interested to learn this tidbit. I certainly was. In 1942, by the time the U.S. actually became involved in, in World War II, Venezuela was supplying London with 80 percent of its oil exports or imports. And the U.K. was entirely reliant on imports at the time uh, to fuel its military. And so without Venezuelan oil, the Allied victory in World War II may have not even been possible. And that's the level of wealth and concern that London and Washington have for Venezuela. They know this, that this is a key base that they need to maintain control over. And so once Chavez came in and began asserting authority, uh, sovereign control of their resources, they unleashed this economic assault that did really damage their oil production capability. Now, the U.S. thought that this would eventually lead to their government falling. But no, over time, Iran, China, and Russia have stepped in to start revamping Venezuela's oil production capacity. And I think Venezuela will get back to where it used to be. But by cutting Iran and Venezuela out of the Western financial network, literally cutting them off from US dollars, we thought, oh, that's just going to lead their governments to collapse. No. When you have China and India as major oil markets, major importers, they'll just by Venezuelan oil, which is what happened. And if they're not using the U.S. dollar to do so, then we're already introducing an alternative to the U.S. petrodollar within 
the oil producing network. Same thing with Iran, hasn't used the US dollar to sell its crude since 2015, I believe. And so they've already been using the euro, using other currencies, using their own national currencies to sell their oil product. Now, under the Biden administration, we cut Russia out of that same network, limited their access to dollars. And what that means is we've targeted three, well, and if you add what we've done to Iraq over the last uh, two, two decades, we've targeted the major founders of OPEC. About three out of the five, we've cut out of the Western financial system and suffocated them, uh, cut them out of dollars. So now tell me, if you're Saudi Arabia and you see this going on, you know that people are already not trading in the dollar, and that India and China are emerging markets that are not going to be controlled by the West. They're going to have their own sovereign policy. They're going to buy oil from whoever they want. Well, does it make sense for Saudi Arabia to continue only trading their oil in the dollar, if that's the case? Do we think that Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates, that their leaders might be sitting around and thinking, you know, 10 years from now, do we really want to be completely reliant on the United States and Europe? Do we want to have our own sovereign identity and will they ever punish us even if we assert our own authority? Will they weaponize the dollar mm -hmm. and weaponize the oil trade network against us? I think they saw the writing on the wall. Yes, of course, Washington will come for you eventually. And so it's no surprise then that this shift is taking place. I think the people in Washington who crafted these policies forgot basic physics. Every action has an equal and opposite reaction. And now they're starting to see for the first time really since the end of World War II, the world is reacting. And what goes up uh, must come down. With wonderful piquancy, President Maduro, uh, whom I knew when he was a, a bus driver, uh, is now getting a red carpet welcome in Beijing as we speak. Finally, Anya, the point about politics is to persuade others who hitherto had not agreed with us of the correctness of the point of view that we have and how we reached it. And you have done that to a remarkable extent because I saw on the blurb on your book no less than Tucker Carlson say that he had substantially borrowed from your point of view as he now views international affairs. I mean, I knew you were good, but that's really remarkable. Tell us who else is on the book? Who else has endorsed it? I'm very, I, I was so floored and just grateful to get that statement from Tucker. And I, I, I also feel fortunate to call him a friend. I, I'm surprised that a few people have responded and said something like, oh, no thanks, I'm not going to buy the book because Tucker blurbed it. Look, that's your problem, not mine. He's the most popular television host in the history of the United States. So, I mean, as you say, I'm not trying to reach the same 50, 100 people that I know from Venezuela solidarity in the United States who always show up for Venezuela and who I'll continue to see in those networks. No, I want to reach all people with this message because it's also just about my country and what I think would be best for my country. And it would be to break away from this crazy transatlantic nexus and be a sovereign, normal country and deal with the world like an adult. I think everybody would be happy, including the U.S. public, if that happened. I, Roger Waters, Oliver Stone, and Francisco Rodriguez is a very important endorsement, actually. People might recognize the other names more because they're celebrities, but I'm I'm so grateful for, for Francisco's endorsement, particularly because he's someone who's not only very respected in foreign policy circles, in, in academia in the United States, but he actually served as an advisor to the last opponent to Maduro in the 2018 election. So he comes from an anti-Chavista, anti-Maduro background. And I think I'm considered a pro-Chavista, pro-Maduro. I mean, that's what I get branded as in in online and, and in mainstream networks. So for him to recognize that what I was 
doing with this book and with my reporting was really just honest and about the facts and for him to make that statement in support of me was 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 really uh, important to me and so i want people to understand who he is especially when they read those endorsements that this isn't just about as you say trying to convince the same people of you know i'm not trying to preach to the choir i i, I hope to reach an audience that may have not formally been interested in Venezuela and understand how make help them understand how it relates to other issues they care about most of all the quality of life in our own country because it's absurd I'm sure we that cut ourselves off best of luck yeah of course Thank you, absurd George. it's our middle name anya parampil author of corporate coup it's been a pleasure and to talk with you on television again Always a pleasure, George. And I promised Thanks. my friend uh, Craig Murray, who's staying with us right now, that I would say hi to you. <laughs> Excellent. I'm very glad that he's uh, he's really burning up in the United States. I saw much of the coverage of his tour there. Give him my regards. Anya, thank you he's so like much indeed for joining us. Anya Parampil, do you believe the official account of 9-11? Yes or no? It's a simple question. Really? Well, on Telegram, only 2% say yes. On Twitter, only 16% say yes. On the YouTube community poll, 8% say yes. And on the YouTube stream, 6% say that yes. That means 98%, 84%, 92%, and 94% do not believe the official account of 9-11. If these numbers don't strike you as remarkable 20 years on, I don't know why. I'll be right back. Stay tuned. A big thanks to the people who support me on the Patreon page. I really have come to depend on the income from that. It costs a pound a week, not even the price of a cup of coffee in an insalubrious cafe. If you think you could stretch to that, please support me on Patreon, patreon.com forward slash George Galloway. Now the Moats team have added a tiered system on my Patreon page where you can become an official Moats graduate. How about that? I speak as someone who graduated from nowhere, uh, from the factory floor in Michelin. But you can become a Moats graduate and legend. You can give a regular donation to support the show and my work. You can now upgrade from a, a mere Patreon to a Moats graduate at £10 a month as opposed to £5 a month, I think it is. Uh, and you can receive official Moats legend status for £20. You are listening to the mother of all talk shows with George Galloway. Donald in Copenhagen wants to react to the Anya Parampil interview of just a moment ago. Donald, welcome. What would you like to say? Oh, hello, George. Well, I would, yeah, I would like to to uh, mention the one thing you. Uh, three or four, maybe five weeks ago, you mentioned something about how how far back our memories, what we can retain in our memories. Is it, you know, four weeks or is it 40 years or, you know, something like that. So it's it's a matter of attitude to protect the American people. And you mentioned uh, how the government and how can it do the things that it's doing in disregard for the people that it's affecting. And it does, and they really don't care. As long as they're getting their money and paying off their bills and what they purchase, the, you know what I mean? It, it goes on to the indifference of human beings and how much we can concern with. People in the United States mostly live paycheck to paycheck. And that's what they care about. Do they have enough? And anybody else, they don't concern about how much they're deprived, particularly of education, the health care, and so on and so forth and the inner structure, and so we can always blame someone else. Uh, and I want to go back to a, a, a memory of my youth when 
Russia has the greatest amount or the large, one of the largest amounts of natural resources for commodities that are needed throughout the world. When uh, Hitler was advised that if he wanted to make his plan of taking over the world, he would need to acquire the resources that Russia had. And this endeavor was called Barbarossa, and it failed, of course. Now we have a country that's trying to do the same thing, and that's called the un- well, United States of America. That's where I come from. You know, and, and I can tell you this, these people, they just do not seem to care. And I'm sorry to say this, but I think that your message and the message of any reasonable thinking person is falling on deaf ears, particularly in that country. The rest of the world seems to be waking up, particularly with these, uh, like I want to mention this, that uh, it was reported how desperate Russia is to go to, to, to uh, North Korea. I think the greater desperation was Blinken and Biden going to Vietnam where they decimated the entire population of people for years. And no one seems to concern about it. It's how much one can retain in their memory that goes back to that, you know. And I think that if we continue to to uh, strive to make it a better world or a good world to live in with well-being of human beings and concerned about the truth, and a couple of things that have come to my mind recently was the remarks that the people in the United States believe about Russia. Eisenhower went to Russia, and they talked about how Russia had its resources and under communism, which was uh, relatively conservative of their resources. And Khrushchev told him that our system will outlast yours. And it seems to have, because they haven't decimated their total environment yet. And we were told that Russia said they would bury us, and hence the Russians are coming and the threat of communism and all of this, and the budget for the military-industrial complex. 1960, I was in the Army and listened to Kennedy, uh, was, was inaugurated coming into power, and Eisenhower left, warning of this uh, industrial economic complex and not to become that. And that's what has been done. And Werner von Braun, at about 1950, when television just came, was was relatively new. And I was born before there was television, and the television. And Werner von Braun was asked directly how Hitler could have uh, convinced so many people of his ideology and stuff. And he told them, "Give the, tell them their deprivation is due to an enemy. Tell them who it is," and they did. And he says, and then you produce for war, and everybody will have a job that seems to be doing good, which people need to occupy themselves constructively and profit by it. You know, and it looks like to me that the United States since then has picked up that baton and has been running with it now since 1950 at least, and going in the same direction, you know, and hopefully more reasonable people, and I think they are in the United States, hopefully that they will not continue pushing on this sleeping bear with an atomic bomb, you know, and that seems to be what's going on, particularly with this war in, in Ukraine, and uh, the United States, the proxy war, that, that's all it is, it's not a war with Russia and Ukraine, it's a war with the United States and Russia using that as their theater, and yeah. hopefully, hopefully... For sure, look, uh, I'll tell you what, uh, I'll tell you what, Donald, you, you've definitely not lost your memory. Uh, And although some people, the younger people that are watching this, will think that you and I are now talking about uh, ancient history. But whilst 1950 to 2023 is a long time in the life of a man or woman, uh, it is a mere bagatelle in the sweep of history altogether. I I was looking at an almost intact mummy, not of an alien, but of a a human female, a woman, uh, uh, on the uh, steppe uh, in Russia or in Mongolia, I can't remember which, but that woman was from 5,000 years ago. So 1950 to 2023 is uh, nothing in the great historical sweep. And whilst it's true that for a brief time, an American empire rose and fell, fell like all empires, it surely did. Donald, thank you for that call. Uh, Now, Nota NATO are back tomorrow night. Uh, They've got a very interesting uh, presentation uh, coming up tomorrow night. There it is, uh, on the so-called grain deal, a grain deal of nonsense. This is a grain deal complained of by the same European Union 
that literally boasted of its success in starving the people of Niger for the temerity of putting in a government that would demand the full 200 euros per kilogram rather than 80 cents per kilogram uh, of uranium. So that's coming up uh, tomorrow night. Uh, please uh, tune in. An email from Kevin. Good evening. I have one question on 9-11. Why were there no plain parts and no black boxes in the rubble? Well, I'm for an inquiry, and it sounds like you are also, Kevin. There are all kinds of things that were found, like intact passports uh, of the Saudi Arabian variety uh, that were found uh, some blocks from the Twin Towers. Here's Simon, a legend, in Florida on Blinken's latest speech, which was an interesting one indeed. I heard it. Go ahead, Simon. Well, Mr. Galloway, one should, I guess, reflect that uh, Chile was indeed the second big event that had occurred on September 11th, the first being the Battle of Teutoburg Forest on September the 11th, where the northern limit of the Roman Empire through Germany was determined with that epic battle that resulted in the ultimate destruction of three Roman legions. But getting back to the new Roman Empire, as they would like to think of themselves, Secretary of State Antony Blinken, at a absolutely ground-shaking speech at the School of Advanced International Studies, part of John Hopkins University, at the new Zip new Zabrinsky Institute building, he of family history from Western Ukraine, gave a speech at which he channeled not only George Bush, where he declared that you were either with us or you were against us, but also Colin Powell's infamous speech of the 5th of February 2003, where he declared in the space of a few minutes no less than 17 times that weapons of mass destruction existed in Iraq whilst waving a test tube full of white powder, as I'm sure you well remember, in the face of all the other UN ambassadors. But today, Mr. Blinken... Turned out to be washing said, powder. Did you know that? Yes. It, tu it turned out to be washing powder. Yes, I, I, I hear you, sir. But now Mr. Blinken has said, and this is truly epoch setting, that we are now at the end of the old era. President Biden has now determined that the world is at an inflection point, and all of the countries in the world must determine whether going forward into the new era, and these are quotes, that they must choose the Western New World Order or they must choose the Sino-Russian version of the New Order. And he's made it quite clear that this is a binary choice. There is no more neutrality. He goes on and quotes Nietzsche, and he says that we have to chart a path to achieve our determined goals without bringing disaster upon ourselves. He is literally stating the new American foreign policy and explaining how they're attempting to achieve it whilst dodging nuclear Armageddon. And to end the speech with this note of reassurance, which I'm sure will fill your listeners' hearts with gratitude. He told us that President Biden understands the world situation better than anybody else. <laughs> Forgive me for laughing, uh, but the idea that President Biden even knows what an inflection point is far less that he understands the world situation better than anybody else. I mean, that's lol and hardy level of comedy. And the fact that it's Biden and Blinken will go down as dismal clowns. 
compared to Laurel and Hardy, brings this hour uh, very appositely uh, to a close. But in the second hour, we've got not one but two great guests, plus your calls. Stay tuned. It's the mother of all talk shows. Mr. President, we got a report of a 50-foot woman marauding through Washington, sir. Thank you, Captain. But I'm looking for a shorter woman, one who likes to take long strolls in the park and yell at minorities. She's not looking for a date. She's terrorizing the city. Is there a difference? <laughs> a little levity. Call in the military. <clears throat> we are the military, sir. Boy, we got here fast. We better do something, right? Shall I scramble the jets, Mr. President? No thanks, I'll just take a muffin and some coffee. You are listening to the mother of all talk shows with George Galloway. Some comments uh, from my very generous patrons uh, who follow me on patreon.com forward slash George Galloway and on whose support I rely. Uh, say, Dr. Randall Doyle says, world-class engineers, irrefutable science, and hundreds, perhaps thousands of eyewitnesses told of a tragedy that occurred 9-11 that did not even come close to the official version. It was an inside job, period. Glenn Jenkins says the official 9-11 account is one of the most unlikely conspiracy theories going. Anyone who genuinely cares about the victims on the day and the millions in the years following should be calling for a fully independent inquiry with Sabinas and evidence on oath. And Ben says Bush Cheney, responsible for the lives of thousands, if not millions. The Biden regime isn't that far behind. And a legend on my Patreon, Graham Briggs White, says the way these towers came down was in a professional, controlled manner. Building 7 went down not even being touched, and footage from the Pentagon security cameras overlooked car park footage clearly shows a missile attack. And uh, Carl in Belfast says, 9-11 Twin Towers and Building 7 were all controlled demolition. Obviously, planes hit both towers, but the full destruction was demolition. Planes alone would not bring the whole building down and Building 7 was not even hit by a plane. Now, if you've got a point of view, uh, call me. Emails uh, have come in, this one from June. If the USA was out of the picture, would there be world peace? God bless June Robertson. Well, I don't want the USA out of the picture. I just want them to do, as Anya Parimpel put it towards the end of my interview with her, just grow up, just grow up and join the international community as an adult. You'll be much more respected, even loved, if you do. Respected and loved is my next guest. Bryce Green is one of the brightest stars in the United States of America. Who can forget his incredible contribution on the Nord Stream before the United Nations Security Council just a few months ago? It's always great to hear from him and we will do now. Bryce Green, welcome back on the mother of all talk shows. Uh, I want to uh, talk first of all, if I may, uh, about the developments yesterday at Sebastopol, which uh, strike me, symbolically at least, uh, to have been an important escalation in the war. Uh, the material damage done uh, will not, of course, change the course of the conflict, uh, these were two ships in dry dock. Uh, but the site of Sebastopol on fire, at the hands of the British, redolent of the Crimean War itself in 1854-1855, will surely uh, bring forth a response from Moscow. What do you think? 
Well, I think that like many new developments in this war, it's a sign of desperation, really. I mean, after the counteroffensive was hyped up by the Western press, you know, you had all these voices, all these you know, well-respected voices saying how glorious and how much the counteroffensive would change the tide of the war. Uh, you had all those people going on, and uh, despite the reports that said that those officials and uh, even Ukrainian officials were worried that the counteroffensive would not amount to much, uh, the counteroffensive went ahead, and uh, you know m many Americans weren't not were not prepared for the actual devastation that the counteroffensive would bring upon the Ukrainian military. And instead of a glorious victory, I mean they, they've seen a dramatic defeat to the point where even Western papers are acknowledging the fact that uh, Ukraine doesn't really have a chance to break through the Russian uh, front lines. And instead of uh, rethinking how they should be approaching the situation in Ukraine, uh, Western press and a, a, a lot of the commentators have focused instead on symbolic gestures that they can point to as showing that Ukraine is actually, uh, you know, dealing some damage against Russia. Uh, I'm sure you've noticed and your audience has noticed a lot of reports about the drone war, uh, that we're seeing drone strikes inside of Russia proper. We're seeing attacks in Moscow. We're seeing all this stuff, but... And they're they're being covered in the U.S. press as you know grand acts of resistance, but even the New York Times acknowledges that these attacks are less uh, about changing the actual military situation on the ground and more about demonstrating to audiences at home that Ukraine might have a fighting chance. And these attacks in Crimea serve that exact same purpose. These shouldn't be understood as uh, you know tide turning uh, counter attacks. These should be understood as what they are, uh, you know, public relations exercises on the part of the Ukrainian and uh, West and their Western backers uh, to try and stem the the tide of all this uh, the, this war fatigue that uh, the populations in both Europe and uh, the United States are feeling. They need to keep this war going, and populations are uh, not on board with it. So they need to show some. Uh, images that might rouse them out of their slumber. But it's plain, uh, as you say, uh, that uh, war fatigue, even Zelensky was uh, referring to it this week, and in fact uh, attempted to blackmail uh, the uh, European and North American governments that uh, the Ukrainian refugees might well turn nasty uh, in their exile. Uh, if uh, this slowing down, as he put it, of support, this weakening, as he put it, of support in the West for Ukraine were to continue. But nonetheless, uh, whilst uh, it's impossible now to conceive of a situation that NATO troops are going to enter this war, NATO weapons are increasingly salient. These were British cruise missiles, storm shadow missiles, that struck Sebastopol and could uh, very well might uh, reach uh, other parts of Russia also. And the United States, having once upon a time said that giving long-range missiles to Ukraine looked like World War III, are now, reportedly, they've announced that they are now about to give long-range missiles to Ukraine, that which was the equivalent of World War III just a year or so ago, is now uh, de rigueur. Uh, so there are still real dangers in the supply of this high-powered weaponry. No, exactly. And uh, when asked about whether or not he uh, agrees with Ukraine using these weapons in Russia proper, uh, you know, U.S. officials, I believe it was uh, Anthony Blinken, well, he said these weapons are Ukraine's and they can do whatever they want with them. And so this falls in a long line of these sorts of escalations in which the U.S. says, well, we don't want to do that. That might be uh, you know, too escalatory and might uh, cause Russia to retaliate. Uh, they keep saying that. They said that about uh, tanks. They said that about high Mars. They said that about F-16s. But every single time, uh, they, the U.S., they end up caving. They end up re- uh, of reneging on their own promises. Uh, and the reason that they keep giving for this is that while initially they were scared that Russia might escalate the conflict and, uh, you know, maybe use 
uh, higher powered weapons, increase the intensity of the war, and maybe even strike a NATO country, uh, they say that the fact that Putin hasn't done that yet means that he never will, and that they don't have to worry about an escalation because Putin's never going to do anything back. Uh, of course, this is insane. Uh, the more and more you keep prodding uh, Russia, the more and more you're inviting a more devastating attack. Uh, but as I've written elsewhere, and as other people have uh, pointed out, uh, a, a heavier intensity attack is exactly what the U.S. seems to be pushing for. Uh, they, this war could have been avoided, as I'm sure we all know, if the U.S. were willing to negotiate and talk about, you know, missile placements and NATO expansion. But, you know, as people in the Atlantic Council were arguing, there's no reason uh, to negotiate because the U.S. Uh, wants a war, that a war would actually uh, further the U.S. objectives in Ukraine of, quote unquote, weakening Russia, uh, which is to say that they want to bleed Russia. They want Russia to throw in all this manpower and equipment only to be swallowed up in the meat grinder on the battlefield. And so the longer this war goes on, the more people who die, the more bodies that are mutilated and destroyed, uh, the better it is for U.S. policymakers. And you can even see this if you look at the what they say. I mean, uh, Washington Post uh, columnist David Ignatius, he called the war in Ukraine a, quote, strategic windfall for the U.S., uh, because, you know, we were able to weaken Russia uh, without much cost to ourselves. Of course, he put in parentheses, well, this doesn't really apply to the Ukrainians who are, you know, dying by the thousand. Uh, but that, of course, doesn't matter to, uh, you know, Ignatius or mostly anyone else in the Western media who are cheerleading this war. And so until that sentiment changes, we're likely going to see uh, the, the drums of war being beaten in the Western press. And that's devastating for everybody. Now, Blinken was speaking today at the Brzezinski uh, School in Johns Hopkins University. Brzezinski would not have recognized uh, a foreign policy which has not only uh, driven Russia and China uh, irreducibly together uh, to the point that they are, in many respects, in a union together, and has now brought the North Koreans onto the battlefield, long basically uh, treated as a slightly embarrassing uh, relative or relic from the past. Uh, now uh, Kim Jong-un and Russia and China are, are uh, BFFs uh, or NBFs. Uh, this is a peculiar achievement for American foreign policy, isn't it? Yes, and uh, well, I, I would disagree that Brzezinski wouldn't recognize this policy. I mean, one of Brzezinski's shining achievements was what he called the Afghan trap, which is when the U.S. supplied weapons to the Mujahideen in Afghanistan with the explicit aim of drawing Russia into a combo, or the USSR at the time, drawing the USSR into an invasion. And, you know, the, the line was that they were able to give Russia their own Vietnam. Uh, you know, a quagmire in which they're bogged down in a situation where they can't win. Well, this strategy seems to have been repeated in Ukraine. In fact, the Pentagon study, I'm sure I've talked about this on your show and elsewhere, a Pentagon study from 2019 uh, lays this out almost explicitly. It says that one of the ways that the United States, United States can overextend and unbalance Russia is by providing more lethal aid to Ukraine, which would then cause Russia to increased their involvement in Ukraine, even to the point of an invasion. So this was known, and I called it the Ukrainian trap, because uh, much in the same way the USSR uh, sprung the trap in Afghanistan, Russia seems to have sprung the trap in Ukraine. Uh, the only difference is, as you say, that uh, rather than leading the to the collapse of the country as it did in the USSR, uh, Russia seems to be solidifying its position in the world. It seems to be solidifying its alliances with China and the uh, the entire BRICS bloc, which is a major development in the world, and appears to be something that the Washington didn't even anticipate. And so Washington is actually in a weak, far weaker position in the global stage than they were before this war, because in, in promoting this war and rejecting negotiations and in trying to get the entire rest of the world to go along with them, they really showed their hand. And to the point where, you know, Latin American countries, African countries, Asian countries are all saying, well, 
we don't really necessarily agree with what the U.S. is doing here, what they're trying to do here, and we'd rather you know, keep lines of communication and trade and commerce open with the BRICS bloc, with the Chinese, with the Russians, uh, and with the U.S. if they'll allow it. Uh, but, you know, this entire uh, ultimatum that the U.S. seems to have thrust upon the world, it doesn't seem to be going in their direction. And, you know, Russia and China and uh, the rest of that bloc, they're in a better position. Yes, but rather embarrassingly now, uh, China was on the side of the U.S. in the 1980s in Afghanistan. Difficult, though, it is to believe now as it was, frankly, then. Uh, and the objective of American foreign policy was to try and keep China and Russia as far apart as possible. This American administration has pushed Russia and China uh, to the, together to the point well, their uh, policy is virtually indistinguishable. And, and, and now they've got the vast armory uh, of uh, Kim, Kim Jong-un uh, joining them. Th that's my point about Brzezinski, who was one of those theorists uh, from the Nixon-Kissinger era onwards, uh, who, who regarded division between Russia and China as, in a way, America's number one foreign policy uh, uh, priority. All right. Well, and that seems to be the case here. I mean, e e dividing Russia and China, uh, you know, the, the communist bloc during the Cold War was one of what they considered to be their shining achievements. You know, Kissinger and Nixon, they uh, went behind the backs of their own people to sign this uh, this agreement with China to open up China. Um, in order to drive a wedge between the Soviet Union and uh, communist China. And like you said, during the 80s, the Chinese were actually involved in some of the intelligence activities uh, funding and supporting the Mujahideen against the USSR. Uh, but that's a far cry from what we see now. Uh, and I suspect that's because these countries and the rest of the world have had the time to read their history books, to understand the actual role that the United States plays in the world the dis destabilizing role, the deliberately destabilizing role that the United States plays. And for all the differences between the Russian, Russian and Chinese systems, uh, well, it seems that they have more in common if they want to uh, withstand and maintain their own sovereignty in the face of what's, I mean, quite cr clearly U.S. aggression in the case of China and uh, U.S. provocation in the case of Russia. I mean, y you look at a map about the uh, of the military bases that are surrounding China right now. You look at the rhetoric that are coming that's coming out of American officials, American admirals and Air Force generals and commentators, all these quote unquote respectable people. Well, they're talking about how we need to go to war with China or at the very least we need to prepare for one. Uh, no one's talking about de-escalation. Uh, no one's talking about, well, maybe we should all try and live in the world in peace and security together. No, in the US, the line is that the barbarians are at the gate and they're coming together. Uh, and we need to shore up our support on this side of the uh, the new Iron Curtain and make sure that the, the bad guys uh, can't get one in. It's complete madness. I mean, there's only one way uh, this, this ends. There's only one way escalation ends, and that's in war. And that's something that no one will survive. Uh, the only other option is negotiation, peaceful coexistence. But, uh, you know, there don't seem to be any adults in the room saying that we should take that line. All the people who are opposed to the war in Ukraine in the mainstream, uh, they seem to be concerned that the war in Ukraine is taking away from the war in China. Uh, and so, uh, like Anya Parampil said, Americans need to grow up. We need to understand that we don't make the rules for the rest of the world. We need to understand that this rules-based order in which the U.S. rules and orders people around is not sustainable, it's not acceptable for the rest of the world, and it's only going to lead to disaster, escalation, and more destruction. Well, as Chairman Mao once put it, Bryce, sometimes the enemy struggles mightily to lift a huge stone only to drop it on its own feet. That's what appears to have happened here. As always, a pleasure talking <laughs> with you, Bryce Green. Much obliged uh, to Thank you. you the numbers, uh, again, 08081 965522. If you want to call the show, it's free of charge in the UK and Ireland. 
In the US and Canada, it's plus one, 844 In the rest of the world, it's 442039662625. An email from Lim, L I M. If Tucker Carlson and RFK formed a third party in the US and ran for president and vice president, would they win? Good work. Thank you. I don't know if they would. I do know that a Donald Trump RFK ticket would sweep the country coast to coast. Now, coming up, we've got a man who used to be a conspiracy theorist, not least on 9-11. He says he's come out of the rabbit hole. Let's check what it was like down there and what it is now like outside in the light. I'll be right back. Just wait a minute. As the green smoke rose, their faces flashed out, pallid green, and faded again as it vanished. Then slowly the hissing passed into a humming, into a long, loud, droning noise. Suddenly, a humped shape rose out of the pit, and the ghost of a beam of light seemed to flicker out after it. Forthwith, flashes of actual flame, a bright glare leaping from one to another, sprang from the scattered group of men. It was as if some invisible jet impinged upon them and flashed into white flame. It was as if each man were suddenly and momentarily turned to fire. That was me narrating H.G. Wells' War of the Worlds. You'll get that on my Patreon page, patreon.com forward slash George Galloway. You'll also get absolutely free viewing of my latest film, Killing Kelly, The Strange Death of Dr. David Kelly, the British scientist and weapons expert who died oh so mysteriously at his own hand, they say. Now, uh, it's not changed our poll except in numbers, but overwhelmingly, our voters don't believe the official account of 9-11. Well, that would once have been manna from heaven for Brent Lee, because he was, once upon a time, a so-called truther, but now he's seen the light. Let's hear what that means. Brent Lee, thanks for joining us on the mother of all talk shows. First of all, tell us what it was like for you down the rabbit hole, as you put it, and what it's like now out here in the blinding light. Hi, George. Thanks for having me. Um, yeah, it, Welcome. when I was down the rabbit hole, it was all consuming. It was every thought that I had. Like, I actually thought the entire world was run through a global satanic cabal. You know, it was it just dominated every aspect of what the world was to me and now uh, out of it you know it feels very liberating to not have this oppressive fantasy ruling my world you see i've never been down the rabbit hole so i am interested in in what life was like down there, uh, and you've written about it, and you've got a podcast, Some Dare Call It Conspiracy, uh, which I'm sure will be illuminating. But just because everything is not a conspiracy, it doesn't, of course, mean that nothing is a conspiracy. I mean, there are certain things that are now accepted almost universally as having been a conspiracy. Uh, the murder of President Kennedy, for example, on Elm Street in November of 1963. Uh, the Northwood uh, operation, where the United States planned to blow up an airliner, uh, killing uh, its own people, and blame it on the Cuban government of Fidel Castro. Uh, these are just two. I could give you many, many more. 
but in the interest of time, why not respond to my point there? Um, what I would say is, yeah, of course, conspiracies happen. Like the word exists, so we know the act exists. Um, what I'd touch on with Operation Northwoods, though, is like nothing actually happened. It was an idea. It was an idea, a plot to do it, and it didn't actually happen. So no conspiracy occurred. So I don't actually understand why that gets brought up and as any type of argument, other than, yeah, well, military it, it, it wasn't just a man something. on the street. Yeah, well, look, it wasn't a man on the street that came up with it. Uh, it was presented to the president himself. Uh, that it should and be he done it. at the very highest level of, and he rejected it. But there was clearly a conspiracy to do it, to plan it. Uh, but leave that aside. Let's talk about the president who rejected it. What happened to him? I forget. Oh. <laughs> yeah, that I don't know. I don't know yet. See, the thing is, is like I said earlier, my idea was that the world was run by a global cabal. Okay. It was more similar to like the beliefs that like people like David Icke promote, you know, the Illuminati, New World Order, deep state, sort of QAnon style of conspiracism. That's what I believed in. So I had to break that down. Okay, that's the first sort of thing that I broke down where I don't believe in an Illuminati anymore. No secret society is running the entire globe. And what I had to do is start going through the different conspiracy theories that built up this Jenga block of my belief system, essentially. And JFK is not one of them that I've got to yet. You know, I don't know what happened. I know what I used to think, but I need to go back on, into it. And that's like the point of the podcast. I want people to share this journey with me, go through the evidence, go through and find out what the truth is. You know, where does the truth actually lie? How did these uh, uh, Kahlo uh, Arab uh, aviation students, none of whom shone in training in their little uh, local and regional flying schools, uh, who attained po po poor marks, how did they manage to fly a plane into the low-rise building at the Pentagon? I don't see a air to ground maneuver as being that rare anymore. I mean, planes do it all the time. I just look at it now as the guy was landing the plane, essentially, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't take a rocket scientist just to see that he was landing it. That's, that's, that's what I can see now. And, and besides that, really? it's definitely a plane that hits. Well, the point the is you can't see it, isn't it Brent? Isn't it, it, <laughs> isn't that the point that you can't see, that none of us can see, that in the headquarters of the United States military, there are there is no footage of an aircraft hitting the Pentagon. All there is is a flash. There's footage, George. Almost at ground yeah. level. There's, there's a flash at ground level, uh, but there's no parts of the plane. So we can't see. Why Why have you done this uh, 180 uh, turn well, on, there, the, on the there Pentagon? There is wreckage. That's the, thing, John, that's the thing, see, George. There is wreckage inside the Pentagon. There is wreckage outside of the Pentagon. There's hundreds of eyewitnesses that saw the plane strike. There's hundreds of witnesses that helped in the cleanup. And there's dozens of people that were injured by jet fuel that doesn't happen if it was a missile. The, the problem is, is that most like 9-11 conspiracy theory documentaries aren't showing you the actual evidence. If you go and look at the mainstream, you know, the, not even the mainstream news, but historians, authors, real journalists that have looked into this, thousands of them over the last 20 years, they show you the actual evidence. You know, and all I had to do really was look at the other side because I rejected even looking at the mainstream. I only listened to like people that really were pushing the 9 11 conspiracy. There is wreckage there. There Haven't were two you just black swapped... boxes found in the Pentagon. 
Brent, haven't you just swapped one Kool-Aid for another Kool-Aid? Once upon a time, no. they were all liars. Totally and not. And now they're all telling the truth? No, because they're not all telling the truth. I can, I guarantee that. Like people always, you know, they charge me with this on, on online and say that like I'm, you know, playing defense for the government. And I'm not, I, I do not like our government. I'm English. I do not like the Tory government. I don't really trust what Labour Party has become. I, I don't really trust the mainstream with everything. You know, I don't trust the politicians with everything, but I also don't just distrust anything they say. I take it as it comes. I'm a critical thinker. You know, I'm a free person and I won't be told by anyone in authority what, like, I should believe. You know, I will test it myself now. So I don't think I've well, gone from one I side wish to you the well other. With your I feel podcast. like I'm much more uh, moderate I'm, now. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm all for moderation and I'm all for uh, free thinking and free men and women. Uh, so good luck with your podcast. I hope people check it out. And thanks for coming on the show. I'd speak to you for longer if I could, but the hour is late. Brent Lee, thanks no problem, for George. joining us. Do you Thank believe... You. The official account of 9-11, uh, you can vote for another 10 minutes or so. 16,252 people have voted. Not even 1,500 voted the last time we asked this question. Robert Nisbet says, Gigi, you are the very definition of a gentleman in your handling of your callers. Thank you, Robert. Uh, Gunni 1972 says, just give Biden 10 square meters of beach as a litter box and tell Hunter the sand is coke. And Bolslaw uh, says, Dear Mr. Galloway, educating your compatriots of the not so great Britain of a great danger to them, created by your government, should be your priority. Nuclear tsunami is no joke, indeed so. And an email from John and Elsie. Uh, the best evidence is the University of Alaska, Fairbanks, extensive study that concluded the World Trade Center was brought down by a controlled demolition. Truth, George, John and Elsie Maxey. Well, there isn't any doubt that it was brought down uh, in a controlled demolition. The owner, who'd only bought it a couple of months before and who gained billions in the insurance settlement, uh, told us that it was pulled down. Uh, the, the contention is uh, that it would otherwise have fallen down by uh, virtue of the fire which had spread from the Twin Towers into it, although there would be no recorded history anywhere in the world of a building of that size and strength and importance, Building 7 of the World Trade Center is is not, uh, you know, a, a ramshackle local uh, 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 put-up somewhere. Uh, this was a prestigious building of importance. And one can see very clearly the explosions uh, seeded throughout the building before it falls in its own footprint. It could not possibly have fallen in its own footprint uh, simply from the impact of the fire which came from the Twin Towers. So, a Building 7 fell without any aeroplane hitting it at all. Uh, and I just think that's very suspicious. Don't you, Mr. Silverstein? I heard no more of as he laughed all the way to the bank with his billions of dollars in insurance money. Ray is in Arizona on 9-11. Let's hear from him. Go ahead, Ray. Yeah, I was... Uh... I was in uh, the Union Hall watching the whole thing live, and uh, you know, and I, I saw the. Uh, our, the reason I paid so much attention is one of the firemen, as the building was coming down, was you know rushing uh, the employees that were working there. He was rushing them out the door, and when he got up there and got on the news camera and started talking about it, he said it was just one explosion after another all the way down, and come to find out that. They had uh, they had been working on the elevator system for you know for uh, I think it was six months before this. Be easy. You take out the you take out the core of the building. It's going to come down straight down. And you know that's and then I, I saw on uh, 
a, a, a demolition expert was on uh, that show Laura Flanders used to call out there. And uh, they had a guy on there that was one of the um, premier demolition experts in the United States takes down all kinds of buildings. They put building number seven in front of them and they said, okay, how long would it take you to take this down? And he goes, it'd take about a year after he looked at the plans and they said, could you do it in a day? He said, no. He said, it's going to take a year. He said, I could do it in six months if, if the owner was willing to pay for the overtime. That's, you know, uh, that was, you know, just right after it happened when she had that guy on their show. Very, very powerful. Thanks, Ray. In Arizona, Rafael is in Vermont. Let's hear from Rafael. Go ahead, sir. Hey, Georgie, I have a question for you because whenever, if you say anything bad about Putin, the Russian, I mean, people from Russia, they will jump on you. They will, they, 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 they don't want you to say anything bad about Putin. But do you understand can you explain to me what is going on? Because today, yesterday, they they almost blew up a blew up a submarine, and Latvia, all those all those places, countries, they are taking action like the German used to do, where it's it's it's, it's prejudice. Is they are attacking the citizen, the citizen, not the military, the citizen of Russia, but. Putin is not saying anything. Do you understand that behavior? And why are the Russians on their own? I mean, they understand everything. They comprehend everything. And for us in the West, we say, like, why is Putin not attacking? And the West, he doesn't have to answer. The mm. Russians themselves will answer that question for you. They understand everything. But me as a foreigner, as a, somebody in the military, a Marine, those kind of things, I mean, yesterday... I mean, hell will go over Ukraine if it was like, if they did that to a U.S. citizen, it, 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 with, with a U.S. equipment. But Russian people, do you understand why is not reacting? What is going on? Can you explain that to me, please? Thank you. Well, I, you know, for a man with multiple cancers, brain cancer, lung cancer, bowel cancer, stomach cancer, a man who's uh, partially paralyzed, a man who actually has died several times in the course of the last uh, 600 days or so. Uh, Putin's doing not bad, I think. Uh, his economy was not crashed into uh, rubble, uh, but is doing better than our economies are doing. His army is not running out of missiles and ammunition. As a matter of fact, it has increased its capacity over the course of this 600 days as all the right-wing hostile uh, English language newspapers are all now conceding. Uh, the uh, best way I can put it is, I don't know if it translates to American English, but Putin is a steady Eddie. Uh, he's not flamboyant. He's not uh, Jack Flash. Uh, he's not an adventurist of any kind. He, he's, the, uh, he's the tortoise in the hare and the tortoise uh, fable. Uh, steady, steady, steady onwards. And that's exactly the approach that he has taken. I do know uh, that inside the Kremlin, inside the top brass of the military, and inside Russian public opinion, there are many, many, uh, who would like him to go faster, go harder, take the gloves off. But uh, Putin is a wise man. Uh, perhaps I should have put it that way. Uh, Putin is wise in the way that our leaders, every single one of them, uh, are fools. And I, I, I really don't think that can be contradicted. Uh, if you took a poll across the world as to whether you'd rather be led by Putin and Lavrov uh, than the uh, two top leaders in your own government, I have no doubt uh, that uh, most people would choose Putin and Lavrov because people can see and can feel instinctively that these are two wise men who in unprecedented circumstances 
uh, or provocation have handled uh, the response to the provocation in a very steady, careful, and wise way. Now, whether that will hold forever uh, depends on the kind of debate going on in the Kremlin right now this evening. And the meeting is still going on. If you've got and I commend everyone, uh, Mr. Gao, GAU's interview with, with Andrew Marr on LBC that's circulating in, the, uh, in social media now. You'll get it on my timeline on Twitter if you haven't uh, already seen it. It's simply masterful how this Chinese gentleman uh, reduces uh, the braggadocio of the United Kingdom to literally laughable levels. Well, here we now have uh, a fly, which is what the United Kingdom is, short of a nuclear confrontation, uh, biting the nose over and over and over again of the Russian bear. Now, will the Russian bear go on swatting it away uh, without pursuing it and without pursuing uh, the nest from which it came, or will uh, the moment come uh, that Russia says, so far as Britain at least is concerned, this far and no further. Uh, I know what I would do if I was in Putin's shoes. It's lucky for James Cleverly and co that I'm not. Thanks, Raf. Uh, Tom in Bournemouth says, I watched Killing Kelly and I enjoyed it last night. Our TV broke down as I was voting for Brexit, and I felt conned by Nigel Farage. But I discovered you, George, and Moat after getting onto YouTube. Keir Starmer is a mix of Blair and Mandelson. Biden has not got enough blame for Nord Stream. Thanks for a great show. Thank you, Tom, in Bournemouth. And on YouTube, June Robertson on 9-11 says, incredible that Cheney Bush knew it was going to happen and didn't stop it. Joan is in London on Nigerian politics. Go ahead, Joan. Good evening, George. Good evening. It's a pleasure to be on your show. Now, the I want to talk mine. about... What would you like to say, Joan? Say that again, please. Oh, the pleasure is all mine. What would you like to say? Yes, I'd like to speak about Nigeria and the current situation with the politics and the presidency. Um, I'm a London-born yeah. Nigerian. I did only my secondary education in Nigeria. And to be honest, since uh, my father, who was an industrialist manufacturing batteries and tires, the first in Nigerian history, um, the manufacturing industry died a slow death in the uh, mid 2000s. I've watched the politics, and Nigeria being such a corrupt uh, country, it broke a lot of us in the diaspora's hearts to see the amount of uh, fraud in the judiciary. Now, I have one of the um, popular mobile phone con uh, companies I don't want to name, um, but this is a practice in Nigeria, which I believe if we had um, the right leaders who have the right education, because my generation of the 60s has enough Nigerians that dissent on the actual situation in the house as a rock. So I would say... Nigerians are quietly fighting for the justice and the right election process, which we haven't done in a democratic way. And that's my comment for the night, George. Well, it's a very good one, John, and don't be a stranger, because we are taking more and more of an interest in Africa in general, and uh, recently uh, in Nigeria in particular. I commend uh, last Sunday's show and my interview with David Hundian uh, and uh, other interviews and commentary uh, for my take on the current generation 
of corruption in politics and in the judiciary in Nigeria. I, I take this opportunity to say two things. First of all, I have never implied that Tinubu invented corruption in Nigerian politics. That would be absurd. Uh, he's, uh, in a way, just the latest incarnation uh, of uh, corrupt political leaders that almost, not entirely, but almost without exception, have risen to power. Uh, in Nigeria and spoiled uh, the potential of the greatest country in Africa, most populous, the richest country in Africa, could be a shining city on a hill in Nigeria, but is not. And that is partly, as David argued on Sunday, the result of imperial design, uh, designed to uh, fail, uh, and thus be dependent on uh, the Western corporations and Western governments uh, that once upon a time had ruled it explicitly and overtly. But I do think that as corrupt elements go, Tanubu is a, a dog-eared and ragged example uh, of, a particular, uh, of a particular lack of quality. Uh, it seems to me if you're going to have a crook run in your country, can't you at least have a more presentable one, a one that can spell uh, his forged uh, university certificate properly, uh, one that will not fight uh, tooth and nail uh, to stop his alma mater uh, giving the public access uh, to his educational qualification reports and records rather and data, uh, one who will not be quite so transparently dingy, dodgy, and despicable as this current moth-eaten, dog-eared tyrant Tanubu is. Secondly, uh, this. I uh, have been, in one way or another, gently and crudely, threatened and browbeaten to give up my commentary on Nigerian politics by people whom I can only conclude have never heard of me before, know nothing about me, know nothing about my political life of over 50 years, because if they did know anything about me, they would know that the surest way to keep me going in a political campaign is to threaten me in order to get me to give it up. That doesn't work with me. Quite the opposite, Joan. When people threaten me, implicitly or explicitly, that just makes me the more determined to get to the bottom of what has been going on in Nigeria. Tanubu and gang, please note. Uh, line two. Oh, it's a legend. It's Norma in Bristol. Go ahead, Norma. You're early. Hello, John. Um, John. Hello, George. No, you know you're at the College of what? Knowledge. Um, I, want, I wondered mm -hmm. if you could help me. Um, what do you think okay. was the motive for 9-11? Because if it was Bin Laden because he had a grudge against the USA, oh, what would be the reason for all that destruction? Or if it was an inside job, there again, I don't understand the reason behind it. Um, I'm probably very ignorant, but I, I just wanted to ask you to help me on this, really. Basically, the motive okay. for 9-11. Okay. Well, uh, I will tell you the motive, but before that, I have to go back to the birth of what became Al-Qaeda. Al-Qaeda were the so-called Mujahideen, so-called holy warriors, so-called freedom fighters that the United States and Britain under Mrs. Thatcher and all the Western countries supported in the war in Afghanistan against the Soviet-backed left-wing socialist government uh, which 
transformed Afghanistan for the only time in its history, actually, that women went to school, women went to universities, women were out and proud and everywhere, working on television, in hospitals, as teachers and so on. The land was redistributed to the peasants. It was a golden age, so of course the West was determined to destroy it. And our weapon of choice to destroy it was bin Laden and uh, what became Al-Qaeda, what became uh, ISIS, what became uh, the Taliban. And we spent, uh, in today's money, uh, another trillion dollars on that, quite apart from the trillion we spent trying to get rid of the people that we put in power in Afghanistan in the first place, on the immoral principle that my enemy's enemy is my friend. And these Islamist elements were the enemy of Moscow, they were the enemy of the Red Army, they were the enemy of the USSR, so of course we supported them. And we didn't care, uh, remembering Dr. Frankenstein, that it was a monster uh, we were creating. And they call it a monster because once you've built it, it's no longer under your control, although it can be rented uh, back again as it was rented back in Syria uh, over a whole decade in which we supported these very same people to destroy the secular uh, Syrian Arab Republic, the very same people that we supported in Libya to destroy uh, the government, the regime of, of Muammar Gaddafi. Uh, so you need to know that, that that's where these people came from. We conjured these people into existence. And we had done so many times uh, before. Uh, we started doing it in the Middle East, in Egypt, in the 1950s, uh, when we supported the development of the Muslim Brotherhood as an antidote to the Arab nationalism uh, of the great Egyptian leader, Gamal Abdel Nasser. Uh, but we did it in many other places too. Uh, supporting extremist fanatics because they were the enemy of the people that we were against. My enemy's enemy is my friend. Now, this monster uh, that we grew, uh, grew and grew and was no longer under our control. And uh, the metastases uh, of this uh, Islamist movement uh, into uh, a terrorist threat to Western countries was grimly inevitable and predictable and predicted, including by yours truly, over many years. I warned that this blowback would undoubtedly arise. So by the time uh, of 9-11, though they had done several operations, the USS Cole, the terrorist attack on an American uh, warship uh, off the coast of Aden in the Yemen, uh, the attacks on the American embassies uh, in uh, Tanzania, uh, and I think in Kenya, if I'm remembering that uh, correctly, uh, were mass casualties, mainly Africans, uh, were, uh, were destroyed by, by what was by then describing itself as Al-Qaeda. Al-Qaeda, as an Arabic term, simply means the base. The Al-Qaeda is the base, and it was indeed the base of the, uh, the Bin Laden mindset and, and ultimately terrorist actions. And so they decided that the people who built them were now their enemy, and they cited uh, a whole lot of reasons why uh, the Western support for dictatorships and tyranny in the Middle East, in the Arab and Muslim world. Well, we were guilty as charged of that. The double standards applied to uh, the suffering of the Palestinian people under an occupation paid for and made possible in every way uh, by these Western, uh, same Western uh, countries and again we were guilty as charged on that and so they embarked upon this nihilistic uh, practice 
of making innocent people pay for the crimes of guilty people. Uh, the guilty people were the rulers of these Western countries. The innocent people uh, were the civilians in the countries ruled by uh, these uh, criminals. And this nihilistic, why I have no hesitation in describing it as terrorism, terrorism is making innocent people pay for the crimes of guilty people because they are soft targets, because you can reach them when you would have more difficulty in fighting against uh, targets which would have rather more justification. And so they attacked uh, the American people uh, on 9-11. I have no doubt that they were involved in the attack. My doubt is were they alone, Norma? My doubt is whether the American state was as oblivious to this plot as they later claimed to be. I have read and watched uh, so much in the last 20 years, I no longer believe uh, the American initial narrative. I don't believe that the uh, pilots uh, who carried out these hijackings uh, would necessarily have been able to achieve the accuracy uh, of, the, of this terrorist operation. I don't believe uh, that there was not necessarily no collusion uh, between agencies of the United States government and these terrorists. I know that there was collusion between these terrorists and some of the closest allies of the United States of America. This I know, this everybody knows uh, who has uh, followed it. 13 of the 19 hijackers were from Saudi Arabia, so obviously we destroyed Iraq instead as part of a predetermined plan that we had and which was attested to uh, very uh, imperiously, very, uh, very convincingly uh, by uh, an American general who was told it in the Pentagon, we're going to bring down A, B, C, D, E, F, G, Arab countries over the next four years, and they tried very hard uh, to do that. So the use to which 9-11 was put it makes me suspicious that the U.S. was ready to use this atrocity for further atrocities, much greater atrocities still. You see, 2,900 people were murdered in the Twin Towers, but more than a million people were murdered in the invasions and occupation yeah, that were yeah. launched off the back of it. And many of them were friends of mine, the people of Iraq, uh, which I knew and loved so well. Last word to you, Norma. Oh, George, I mean, um, there's so much hate and so much... I, I really can't put up with it. Um, I mean, well, you've told us an awful lot of things for me to take in. Um, I, I, I'm trying to take in what you said, which is very complicated. But my golly, what an awful world we're in, you know? That's yeah, we're in a mess, yeah. We're, we're in a mess, and our, our leaders put us in that mess. Uh, listen back to what I said, Norma, uh, after the show or tomorrow. Uh, and uh, if you have any further questions, of course, I'll be delighted to deal with them. Ghost of John Judge says, America need to understand their history. They need to totally relearn the history of the 20th century and the relevance of one Herbert Hoover in the events of that bloody century. And Just Reason says, I've been following GG since the early 90s, and one of the best episodes of BBC Question Time I've ever watched was when GG appeared with Tony Benn, a classic. Well, I wish there was more time. I don't always, but I wish there was more time tonight because we have discussed necessarily superficially some of the greatest and most earth-changing, earth-shattering events. And unfortunately, we're doomed 
uh, to repeat that over and over again. I would very much have liked to have had more time uh, to address the issues uh, that arise out of 9-11 and to make my case that there are too many holes in the official narrative. Too many things have been covered up. The inquiry uh, did not subpoena people, uh, did not question them on oath. And the evidence of the president and the vice president and the defense secretary of the United States were heard in camera and are redacted uh, for the lifetime of everyone watching this. I just think there's more to it than met the eye. And this is a view that I have slowly come to and now hold definitively. Moreover, as this poll tonight shows, it's one that is widely shared. I frankly don't believe anything that they tell me, even when they're telling me the truth. I don't believe the British government. I don't believe the American government. And if I was French, I wouldn't believe the French government either. What I do know is that millions of people lost their lives as a result of what happened on 9-11, and they're still losing them. The war unleashed on the back of 9-11 has not stilled and will not still in the lifetime of every one of you watching this this evening. Who wouldn't want more time to lay out my theories, my views, and the proposed solutions uh, that I believe in on such weighty and important matters. Maybe I'll get more chance to do so on Sunday because, God willing, I'll be back on Sunday at the earlier time of 7 p.m. UK time with the mothership, the mother of all talk shows. It's now regularly, thanks to the pirates, you know we've got pirates that get more than half a million views on our videos, and I'm very glad that they do. I kind of like pirates. More than two million people watched. Coming. See you next week.